It is springtime. <laughs> Welcome to the April 2022 episode of Fish Trap Fireside. It's the final show of our ninth season, and hopefully the last time we'll come to you exclusively online. While you might miss the nice view of my neighbor's barn in the background, it's sure going to be good to get together again in person next season. For those of you who are new to Fireside, this is a monthly reading series designed to feature diverse voices from local writers here in Wallowa County, Oregon. Each month offers a fresh look at what people of the West are thinking about and writing down, and we've got a great one for you this month. Our featured readers are Fish Trap friends Ashley Tackett, Ralph Swinehart, plus special guest Fish Trap's 2022 writer-in-residence E.M. Ellen Lewis. This month's episode of Fireside is sponsored by Stuart Jones Designs, a custom jewelry designer working in Wallowa County since 1999. Learn more at stuartjonesdesigns.com. Hey, while I've got you, pull up your calendar and circle Friday, October 7th. That's when we'll launch the 10th season of Fish Trap Fireside with a big party and celebration in Fish Trap's new event space. We're moving into the historic 1899 Bowlby Building on Main Street in Enterprise, and we couldn't be more excited about it. And you can help make it a place for everyone to enjoy. Consider donating to the Bowlby Building campaign at fishtrap.org. Okay, let's get to our first reader. You're going to like this. Ashley Tackett is a designer, developer, educator, and is fundamentally a country gal at heart. Beauty, connection, and growth are her guiding stars to an engaging life. Ashley is also a community-minded person who, among many other things, serves on both Fish Trap and the Giuseppe Center for Arts and Culture Board of Directors. After a two-year stint living alongside snakes, steelhead, and turkey in Imnaha, Oregon, Ashley is presently carving out a life under the bright, warm sun in old Mexico. Welcome, Ashley Tackett. Thank you, Mike. Okay. Tonight, I'm gonna to read a piece that feels just right for spring with all its freshness and flowers and romance. It's a very personal story about love, but it's not achingly sweet because there are many types of love. But for me, this one is deep and soul arranging. It's a story I'm calling Imnaha Erotica, but don't worry, it's rated PG. I remember what it feels like to fall in love. I should know because I do it often. I welcome that hormonal cocktail that makes you feel brighter, more awake. When I was a younger lady of 27, I experienced love at first sight. This love was not with a person, but with a place. I was on a road trip with a sweet boyfriend. It was spring break and we needed to scrub our minds with a good long drive. So we meandered from Eugene, Oregon to Wallowa Lake. It was March, the mountains were socked in and I was freezing. In those days before my phone called the shots, I had a big paper map that showed that we could drive just a bit further to the end of the state. So curiosity sent us down a dead end road to the town of Imnaha. For those who aren't Wallowa County insiders, let me give you context. According to the 2020 census, Naha has a population of 118 people, has one school with about seven kids, a pint-sized post office, and importantly, it has one business, the Naha Store and Tavern. And the tavern's a restaurant, community center, pool hall, honky-tonk, general store, and is easily one of the most charismatic bars around. And at the heart of it all, in a deep, staggering canyon, is the Naha River. When I dropped in for the first time, I know I said, holy shit. And this is where the arc of my love story begins. Imnaha in the spring after a good wet winter is shockingly green and looks a bit like Kauai. That first visit, we spent three nights at the Imnaha Motel, ate fried chicken at the tavern, tossed a dollar on the ceiling, hiked down Cow Creek and my heart was hooked. I left that trip feeling enchanted, knowing I had discovered something distinct. Many years passed before I went back to Imnaha, but I love telling people about it. It was my insider secret. About seven years later, I had a different boyfriend, a stylish man from Portland. We were on the verge of separation and he revealed he had an engagement ring and planned to take me to Imnaha to propose. To Imnaha. 
He had remembered hearing that love in my voice when I talked about it. And it was a very romantic plan, but the timing was terrible and that ship had sailed. A few years later, I heard about a man who had a plan to turn a beat up building in Joseph into an inspired hotel. By this time, I had a good career in architecture designing hotels. My first email said something like, your Joseph Hotel sounds cool, but I'm an Abnaha gal myself. I'm not sure if it was my insider lingo or my credentials or maybe just fate putting me exactly where I needed to be, but I began to work on this hotel and it eventually it evolved into a romance and eventually I moved to Joseph. I remember saying, holy shit, I can't believe I live 30 minutes from Amnaha. Life in Joseph was very fun and very busy, making a home, a hotel, school, store, and restaurant. I often went to Amnaha looking for better weather and an escape from all the work. Years into it, my boyfriend asked, what's next? Well, I was at the very brink of burnout, so spoke from my heart when I said the only way I would invest my energy was if it were a house in Italy or in Naha. Intentions are powerful, and within an hour of speaking those words, a juicy piece of real estate popped up. Not one, but three cedar-clad houses directly on the Amnaha River. The next morning, I took a tour, and I knew it was my dream. Three cabins, a beach, a dock, and million-dollar views. So I made an offer. And looking back, I think that love stepped in and erased my logic. Love is kind of like this. It's a feeling that often overpowers thinking. When my homes closed, it triggered an avalanche of unexpected events. I broke up with my Joseph boyfriend and a virus shut the entire world down. And I was at this climactic fork in the road. Sell everything and start fresh or move to a Naha. And even though I adored it, I never ever planned to move by myself to the middle of nowhere. It was gonna be my vacation home, my sanctuary. But there I was, I just bought three houses and my affection for the canyon had already outlasted three boyfriends. 13 years after my first visited, I moved to Amnaha. My homes had a very cool origin story. They were built by a famous country Western musician, Lloyd Doss. His band, the Sons of the Pioneers had a popular song that goes, see them tumbling down, pledging their love to the ground, lonely but free I'll be found, drifting along with the tumbling tumbleweeds. I became a tumbleweed, moving to a place wilder than anything I knew. And in the beginning, I had no clue. I also had no internet, no cell service, and was a winding 30 miles away from my basic needs. Plus the weather was getting hot and I was waiting for rattlesnakes. But I figured it out. I became agile at organizing my entire life around my drives to town. A detailed grocery list, toting my laundry, hauling my garbage, choreographing my social calendar. Also, I could lead a life with good friendships and clean underwear. It was authentically hard, but when you love something, it's easier to endure. And it did feel like love that first summer on the river. Even though my home was a portrait of rugged isolation, I saw beauty in every direction. Literally from my bed, from almost everywhere, I could turn my head and watch the river shimmer. My routine unfolded centered around an active relationship with the land. I knew exactly what time the sun climbed over Grizzly Ridge and cast its warmth on my deck. So every morning I stopped work, grabbed coffee, sat by the river and said hello. Yamnaha is known for scorching hot summers, and I learned this is very true. By midday, my brain would melt and signal time to go swimming. Past my second cabin, through the garden, beyond the blackberry bramble, was the primo swimming hole, the confluence of Big Sheep Creek with the Yamnaha River. I would snack on berries, skinny dip, and get back to work. Five o'clock was social hour when my nice neighbors emerged for family river snorkeling. It was a sweet life. It was also a deeply quiet life, so I deeply attuned to nature. I began to write it down, an Amnaha almanac. I tracked kingfishers, canyon wrens, quails, so many turkey, black bear, big horn, a family of five otters, elk in the winter, steelhead in the spring, rattlesnakes in the summer, coyotes at night, 
mule deer all the time, and that one cougar that scared the hell out of me. My almanac noted when the flowers bloomed and the parade of fruits that followed. I learned to tell time based on these flowers and fruits and all the critters, and it was one of my favorite gifts of country living. But of course, everything feels ecstatic in the beginning. Like most love, my relationship with Imnaha evolved into something more realistic. My friend Ken told me that you don't live in Imnaha without experiencing loneliness. And so I joined that club too. I had a sharp pang for human connection. I delighted when the UPS guy knocked on my door. But there was the Imnaha Tavern. Every afternoon between three and five, the locals came for happy hour. I'm not a drinker, but I adored their commitment to beer because it meant I had a captive audience of real life people. It's a group of highly capable, retired Fox News watching men. Even though my profile paints an opposing portrait, I'm a far left leaning hippie yuppie career woman. We made friends. With 118 people living in a far away remote canyon, you learn the value of everyone. When I had any question at all, I waited until four and walked to the tavern. How do I witch water? How do I seed my lawn? How do I kill a rattlesnake? Somebody was always there to reassure me. So in the middle of a global pandemic and a divisive presidential election, I got a degree in civility from the Amnaha Tavern. When I wasn't hanging with the older men, I learned how to attract men my age to the far nether regions of Oregon. There was the very handsome potential mayor of Seattle and also the radiant film director from Portland. And then I met a gorgeous Peruvian man while jumping in Wallawa Lake. That might've been love at first sight too. And all of these experiences gave me hope that love lives everywhere, even in the Naha. But I learned that love can be both genuine and short-lived. As I rooted deeper, making my home, I grew weary of working so hard. I trenched my yard, replaced my septic, drilled a well, upgraded my electrical, planted a garden, and coaxed every subcontractor in Wallawa County to help me. And I did it well. I remade three houses into very beautiful homes. That was just before my gutting realization. Making home in the middle of nowhere was going to require my time and energy forever. I considered this, then fretted over it, then lost sleep. You can't hide from the truth for long. My heart knew. I was not going to stay in that one place, even in an exquisite place forever. I guess I am a tumbleweed. I value my freedom above most everything else. So after two years and a stockpile of remarkable experience, I sold my homes and opened the door wide for something new. I'm letting my heart lead the way because it led me to a Naha, and that was the best erratic decision I've ever made. When I think about a Naha now, I still believe it's paradise on earth. I still feel a spark of energy and nothing but love in my heart. I have plans to return when the black locusts are in bloom, and I have a feeling I'll say holy shit when I see the canyon. And like some of my old boyfriends, I believe I'll keep in touch forever. Thank you. Ah, Yamnaha. Thanks, Ashley. Hey, do you know a kid who loves to write and tell stories? Fishtrap is now accepting scholarship applications for young people to attend Summer Fishtrap for free. Students entering fifth through eighth grades can spend a week with the wonderful Dr. Janae Brown Wood, and those entering ninth through twelfth grades can explore their creative potential with Cameron Scott. Go to fishtrap.org to learn more and apply. Okie dokie, our next reader is a familiar face to most everyone who lives here. Ralph Swinehart moved to Wallowa County in 1972 as part of the Back to the Land movement and has spent the last 50 years developing his small farm, building his own barn, solar home, and outbuildings. His friend Rick calls his storage shed the MTA. That stands for Monument to Accumulation. <laughs> Ralph restored his first car, a 1928 Ford Model A, while he was in high school, and he still drives it regularly. That old Ford has attracted several other antique cars, which also enjoy living in the MTA with it. Ralph recently sold his sheep after raising them for 46 years and is still a part-time civil engineer, but he mostly works now 
on becoming a full-time Luddite. Welcome, Ralph Steinhardt. Thank you, Mike. I'm going to read uh, two short pieces tonight. The first one I call Dark Secrets. Whilst on a family skiing trip in Bend in the mid 80s with my dad, my brother and his kids, I had my dad alone for dinner. With a fair amount of trepidation, I asked him, what do you know about your Uncle Bill? Uncle Bill? I don't have an Uncle Bill, just Dorsey and Cyrus. What are you talking about? He asked. I told him I had been reading through the latest family history book that our extended family publishes every couple of generations. The first was written in 1909, the second in 1942, and the most recent in 1985. Each volume gets bigger and more comprehensive as the family continues to expand. I had chanced upon an entry that mentioned that my great grandfather Noah had had his first child in 1865 with Christina, who with a little research turned out to be his first cousin. What? My dad couldn't believe that such a thing could have happened or surely he would have heard about it. So I sent him a copy of the appropriate pages of the book. He didn't think it could be true because his grandfather Noah was busy fighting in the Civil War with the Ohio 126th Volunteer Regiment at the time when said child would have been conceived. So he wrote to the War Department where all the military records are kept and they sent him copies of Noah's records that indicated that he had been wounded in the Battle of the Wilderness on May 12, 1864 and was sent home on medical leave for a couple of months. So it was possible that he could have been home during the appropriate time period. What was Noah's world like at the time? It was a terribly bloody time of the war and the battles of wilderness in Spotsylvania County Courthouse had just been fought in Virginia. Noah's cousin Enos had been killed in this battle and is memorialized on a stone monument at the battlefield, which William Least Heat Moon commented on in his book, Blue Highways. In that book, he, counted, he recounted the recollections of soldiers who, had, who said the intense rifle fire from the close battle lines had cut down oak trees two feet in diameter. One soldier noted that we not only shot down an army, but also a forest. In the end, nearly 13,000 men on both sides had been killed and many more wounded, including Noah. So what was Noah's world like when he was sent home to recuperate? They hadn't invented the term PTSD yet, but I'll bet he had it and his cousin Christina was there to comfort him. One family account indicates that he may have been recuperating in her father's home. Noah may, Noah may never have been with a woman before, but he surely would have heard lots of stories from his soldier buddies, and he may have thought that he never would because he would surely be sent back to the slaughter as soon as he recuperated and would have, good, and would have a good chance of being killed himself. But the deed had apparently been done Noah recovered and was sent back to war, was promoted to corporal in January 1865, survived the war and was mustered out with his regiment on June 25th, 1865. By this time, he was apparently the father of young William, but there was no record of him and Christina marrying and no mention of the event in the family history until 1985. Noah went on to marry my great grandmother, Sarah, in October 1865, and they had a long and successful marriage. Noah tried to continue farming for a while, but his war injuries made this too difficult for him, so he bought and ran a hardware store in Somerset, Ohio for many years. Christina went on to marry in May 1867, and they had three more children. My dad did write to an Ohio cousin who was doing genealogical research at the time, and she said that she had discreetly asked relatives of Christina, and at the time could only confirm that William had been alive in 1870 and showed up in the census that year living with Christina's parents, his grandparents. He did keep Noah's surname. Perhaps it is fitting that they raise him since he may have been conceived under their roof. It makes one wonder who knew what at the time. My great grandmother surely would have known and perhaps this knowledge helped keep Noah in line for the next 35 years of their marriage until he passed in 1900. And it's still amazing to me that my father had never heard of William. At the time, my father blamed me for bringing the whole subject up, but later admitted that his grandfather Noah might bear some of the responsibility. But that was as far as we could go at the time, and we were left wondering what happened to Uncle Bill. While doing research for this piece, I did a little more Googling for information and found on Wikitree that one of my cousin's sons and one of Christina's descendants had dug up more information over the years and had posted that William had died in January of 1924 at the age of 59. There was no record of him having married or having children. He surely knew his heritage 
and perhaps, perhaps he was worried that any child might have genetic defects due to the close relationship of his parents. Perhaps we will never know a real true story, or maybe a diary, a diary will show up in someone's trunk someday, and we will get the rest of the story. Thanks. Um, the next one I'm going to read is actually a slight redo of the first thing I read at a fish trap open mic in 2014. So here goes. I call this one clam chowder. My dad made really good clam. Sorry. My, my dad made really good potato soup right up until the point where he put the clams in it and ruined it. I really don't like clam chowder, so I'm going to talk about something else. How about Wilma? Wilma the Wonder Waitress, to be exact. When I first moved here in the early 1970s, there were only a few places to eat in Enterprise, and the most popular was the Circle T Ranch Cafe at the corner of Main and First Street in the two-story Bowlby Stone building next to the OK Theater. It was called the Circle T because the Taylors owned it then. Before them, the Coyles owned it, and it was called the Circle C. There is an ad painted on the mural of businesses, many long gone, on the stage of the Hurricane Creek Range for the Circle G Ranch Cafe, so I suspect, suspect that there had been an earlier version yet. In those days, the Circle T was open 24 hours a day, 364 days a year, closing only once a year for a thorough cleaning. Anyway, Wilma worked there and was an amazing waitress. One summer I was doing inspection work for a crew that was doing the first major cleaning and TV inspection of the Enterprise sewer system since it had been built in 1915. They liked to start work early, so I would often drop into the Circle T at 6 a.m. for a quick breakfast. Wilma ran the show at that hour before the cook came in for the regular breakfast crowd. I would sit at the counter and drink my coffee and eat my eggs and watch the old guys come in for breakfast. They would just come in and sit at the counter and Wilma would set their coffee in front of them, and then go into the kitchen and cook their breakfast and set it in front of them, all without a single word having been exchanged. And when, the time, when they were done eating, Wilma would bring out the dice cup and roll them double or nothing for their breakfast. When they got busy there, she would go into high gear and handle lots of customers with great efficiency. And she had an amazing memory. A friend's father would come in to visit once a year and would be greeted by, well, Herb, you want the same thing you had when you were in here last year? Bill Forrester was a reporter for the Chieftain and he was really amazed by her and decided we should take up a collection for a plaque to give her, proclaiming her Wilma the Wonder Waitress. It hung on the wall behind her counter for years. It was there when Craig Leslie came through Enterprise doing research for his book, Winter Kill. You will find her mentioned there on page 86. I had an office in town, so I often ate lunch at the Circle T. They had really good soup, so I was likely to have soup four out, four out of five days, but never on Friday. Yep, you guessed it. On Friday, they always had clam chowder, and I don't like clam chowder. One Friday, I was sitting at the counter trying to figure out what to order for lunch when the guy sitting next to me shouted out, Hey, Wilma, who got the clam today? I asked him, is it really that week? And he replied that it sure was. So I told Wilma that I would have the soup today as well. It wasn't all that bad. So after I read that, Pam Royce, who was, who was running the uh, firesides at the time, said, you know, I think Wilma might still be alive. So she arranged after a couple of months of digging around to find her living in the Alpine house in Joseph. And we went over to visit her. And I, was able to chat with her for a while, give her a copy of this little piece. And, and it was just good to see her after all those years. And it's, um, she died a couple months after that. So we was lucky we did it when we did. But if it hadn't been for Fish Trap, that little visit wouldn't have happened. So thanks, Fish Trap. Hey, thanks, Ralph. Since 1988, Fish Trap has been a place for clear thinking and good writing in and about the West. And in that spirit, we have a couple writing workshops coming up I think you'll enjoy. Wednesday evenings in May, we offer an online workshop with Katherine Johnson, Two Ideas, Grappling with Paradox and Tension in Personal Essay and Memoir. On Saturday, April 16th, Learn the fundamentals of playwriting with Ellen Lewis. This one-day workshop takes place in person here in Wallawa County and is on a pay-what-you-can scale, so anyone can afford to attend. 
And it just so happens that instructor Ellen Lewis is our spring writer in residence and next reader. We're really lucky to have her with us. Let me tell you a little bit about Ellen's background. Her operas and plays have been produced around the world. She has received the prestigious Steinberg Award, the Primus Prize, the Portland Civic Theater Guild New Play Award, a fellowship from Princeton University, a 2016 Oregon Literary Fellowship, and the list goes on. Ellen lives in Oregon's Willamette Valley on her family's historic farm. But for the month of April, she's here in Wallowa County. Please welcome E.M. Ellen Lewis. Well, thanks, Mike. I'm so glad to be here with you and looking forward to being out in Joseph very soon uh, for my residency. I'd like to um, share a song lyric, a monologue, and three poems with you today. Uh, the song is called My Car Knows the Way to Montana. I burst out the door with my bag and guitar, Pete screaming at me as I get in the car. He shouts, if you leave, you can never come back. I screech out the driveway, you got it, Jack. My hands shake and I grip harder onto the wheel. I can't get my breath, I'm sick. Oh, I feel I pull to the side of the road and throw up. Then wash out my mouth with cold coffee from a battered old cup. Failed again, failed again. Well, anyhow, dust yourself off, girl. Okay, what now? I wipe my mouth on an old bandana and get on the highway, heading east toward Montana. My car knows the way to Montana. When I screw up, back I crawl. There's something about the sky there, the star's bright silver sprawl. If you haven't seen stars in Montana, you haven't seen stars at all. I'm driving too fast and too crazy, but there's no one to mind anymore. 53 to the 26th and on to the 84, 82, 395, press the gas pedal to the floor. I sing with Bruce on the radio. He always knows what to say. I drive through the Cascade Mountains, the skies an ugly gray. Get gas and coffee in Ritzville, fill up whenever you can. The miles begin to unwind me somewhere east of Spokane. I'm a little past Missoula when I almost hit a bear. I swerve to the side of the road and breathe in that clean, sharp, cold Montana air. My car knows the way to Montana. When I screw up, back I crawl. There's something about the sky there, the stars' bright silver sprawl. If you haven't seen stars in Montana, you haven't seen stars at all. I pull out my Pendleton blanket and perch on the hood right where, there where I park and eat my plastic wrapped gas station sandwich as dusk turns into dark. I want to take the long way home, I tell the first bright star. I guess I get to decide that now since I'm the only one in the car. I'm alone again, God damn it, but I guess it could be worse. I'm in the most beautiful place in the world with all the stars in the universe. My car knows the way to Montana. When I screw up, back I crawl. There's something about the sky here, the stars bright silver sprawl. If you haven't seen stars in Montana, you haven't seen stars at all. This monologue, um, is from a big play I wrote called Magellanica, which is set in uh, Antarctica, South Pole. Um, the character speaking is a Norwegian ornithologist by the name of Lars Broten. He says, I am very good English. I do story in Norwegian for them to laugh because most important thing is laughing. No, wrong word. Norwegian really is better language for communicating the ideas that are complicated or beautiful. Joy. This is word, yes? This is word because it is deeper. In Harstead, south of Tromsø, my place where I am from, I sit last year in little, smaller than cave, only little hole in stone beside nest of white-tailed sea eagle. 17 hours with no moving, me or Mrs. Bird. And then there is a 
the smallest sound and she is moving and then tiniest babies hatching out of their shells. <laughs> Beautiful things, full of joy like this thing we must fight to keep, yes? I wrote um, both of these next poems on last year's fish trap outpost trip to the Zumwalt Prairie with a wonderful Kim Stafford, who was our, uh, our poet, our leader. This one is called When I Need But Don't Know What. When I need but don't know what, I go to the quenching place along with all the other creatures, the flit flit and the speckled orange flutter and the buzzy buzz and the blue fire stick. We tuck ourselves down among the whisper green. I put my feet in, careful not to disturb the skitter gloves and surface dancers. Honey mothers bumble by, a cheek brusher blows through the whisper green, giving me a comforting caress and I, who arrived alone, sets herself apart, become a grateful, cool footed, belongs here. This one I wrote on the last day there on the prairie. It's called The Undoing. I wake when golden sunlight pours into my tent. Last day. Today is the last day. I wander down to the house for a cup of coffee, then return to my campsite and begin the dismantling, the tearing down, the packing up, looking at everything with deer eyes like it's the last time because it is the last time. It's so hard to leave. I don't want to leave. I don't want to lose this prairie grass softness, this mossy green vulnerability. I pull up my stakes and roll up my sleeping bag and reach toward trust. What we've built here is durable. We will carry it home in our hearts. And when we think back on it, we'll be as sturdy as basalt, as cool and flowing as Camp Creek, as vast and open as the Zumwalt Prairie itself. This, uh, this last poem is about an event I didn't get to go to, and it's called The Concert. Dear Yo-Yo Ma, I wasn't in my seat last night for your concert. I bought a ticket two months ago when things were looking up, but it's all gone sideways again. I did so want to come and hear you play. I love your music. Your version of box cello suites might be the soundtrack to my life. I listen to it so often, finding in those smooth, calm notes, such simplicity, complexity, and comfort. If it was a record, I'd have worn deep the grooves by now. I waited till the last minute to decide for sure, but the numbers here in Oregon are terrible right now, and I have more than just myself to think of. I did a cost benefit analysis, then shook the magic eight ball. It said, not a good idea. I've never seen you in person, but I've watched the clips of you playing Dvorak with Itzhak Perlman and the Wexford Carol with Alison Krauss and Wayfaring Stranger with Rhiannon Giddens. You've played in parks and palaces with dancers and banjo players and Mr. Rogers and Muppets. Your songs of comfort during quarantine brought me great solace. And I wanted to clap for you, to smile up at you there on stage under the stars and let you feel my gratitude. We need music more than ever right now. The droughts and plagues and wars and fires and hurricanes and fighting amongst ourselves and isolation are getting us down. We need your rosined bow and cello, weaving music out of wood and air and strings, calm, amused, determined, pulling us together, reminding us we aren't alone. So today, here on the farm, sitting by the creek under a tree with the dogs and crickets, 
as the sun goes down. I put on my earphones and switch on your cello suites again. I close my eyes and dream that you're as close as you sound, perched on an old lawn chair by the campfire, playing one song after another and sharing stories from your travels and roasting marshmallows, being careful not to burn your fingers, smiling at the sweetness. Maybe we'll even sing when the stars come out just for the joy of it. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ellen and Ralph and Ashley for sharing your stories with us and to Stuart Jones Designs for sponsoring Fireside this month and to all of you for watching. If you liked what you saw, share Fish Trap Fireside with your family and friends. Anyone, anywhere can take in Fireside online at fishtrap.org and on Fish Trap's YouTube channel. Okay, that's all, folks. Have a great summer. And if you're in the neighborhood this July, come up and visit us at Wallawa Lake for Summer Fish Trap. See you then.